Então, vamos falar em que língua? Em inglês, em inglês. Em inglês, ok. Então é melhor começar já a changing. I grew up as an only child. My father is Brazilian and he's an architect. My mother is Portuguese and she had an art gallery. So I grew up always in the middle of this deep, intrinsic, artistic environment. Always with my house full of artists from the gallery that came to visit or to have dinner with us. My father making barbecues with all his friends, architects, artists, a lot of them foreigners. The environment was very rich and me being an only child and lots of these people, some had children, some didn't. So I was always around them, listening to their conversations, building into trying to hear what they were talking about, always sketching. I always had my drawer with my toys, with my sketchbooks and I, they would start playing cards and I would go to my corner, pick out my things and I would play alone for hours on hours and hours. So I used to travel a lot with them. My parents took me everywhere, for example. My father, I was always asking him, I need to go to the zoo. I want to go see these animals. Please take me to the zoo. And he would always say, Joana, no, I'm against the zoo, but I will take you to the zoo when I feel it's time that you should go. But I'm going to take you to a real zoo. I said, okay. One day I arrived from school. I was about 13 years old. And he said, Joana, next week we're going to Africa. So get ready. So there we went, the three of us, on a huge safari, staying in lots of different reserves and watching the animals, you know, right there. And I even saw an, a fight between an elephant and a lion. At three o'clock in the morning, my father called me and said, come look. So we were in our room and the animals were passing with and he said, you see who's the king of the jungle? You know, it's the elephant, it's not the lion. We lived a lot of special times. My mother always sang jazz and fado and bossa nova. So the house was always full of music. It was very beautiful. I had a really beautiful child, I must say. My father wanted me to be a global, a citizen of the world. And, uh, it, and my mother, yes, she went along, but my father was more wanted really for me to be bilingual, etc. So that also was very rich for me, you know, in my, in my imaginary world, in my cultural world. So all of these things added to, to my childhood, yeah. My father is definitely my biggest inspiration in life. He always taught me to color outside the lines, you know? First you need to learn how to color inside the line, and he made sure that I could do that. And then he said, now play. If you can do that now, go ahead and play. Go outside the line, break the rule, but be constructive in the way that you do it. So he, because of his also his malandragem, he had a bit of this bossa nova in him that he I think I, I, I had acquired it by just being around him so much. And I have this also. It's a way of communicating, it's a way of living that you risk. So he always risked a lot. You know, he was a great adventure and he always taught me to surprise myself constantly, to surpass myself, not to do everything exactly as the rules demand, but to do it constructively. So when you go outside, you need to do it in a, in a, in a creative and in a constructive way. My mother, she's my pillar in life. My mother is the more intellectual side. My father has a, a huge intelligence, but it's also more emotional, more adventurous. And my mother is, is, is a center, is my core. Very intelligent woman, also very sensitive to, to creativity, to arts. The beauty of their relationship and how they balanced each other always. They, they had a lot of uh, discussions, but it always ended up in a constructive way of dialoguing. Even me, when they put me, when my father gave me a punishment for some reason, he would always explain to me why he was giving me this punishment and if I agreed and how long he, I thought I should have this punishment for. So we'd come to an agreement together. So there was always a lot of dialogue. And, it was, and that was very important because uh, I understood why I was being punished and I thought I should be. So we agreed, yeah, I really, it, it, this was too, too much. So then when I misbehaved a little bit, and I like to have my malandraje and my bit of, a little bit of a rebel sometimes, he would kind of close an eye and say, okay, as long as it's not too much. But then when I went too far, he said, okay, Joana, let's talk. Never being influential to the point of saying, you must do this, you must do, do this, never, but always shape, helping me to shape and to fine tune You know, where were my talents? Where were the parts that I had that were not so uh, strong, helping me to strengthen those parts? So they were fundamental in my life. I love objects. I've always loved objects. For me, I always usually have something in my pocket with me every day, something that 
reminds me of someone or reminds me of a moment or something that I've lived. So when I was young, my toys were not at all dolls, Barbies. They were usually old wooden toys. Something was broken, for example, in them. And then together with my father, who was also very good at with his hands at bricolage and had a little workshop at the back of our house with all the tools. We'd go there, we'd fix it, and we would add something to it. And I like that. I always like to have something that had kind of a glitch in it, an object with a glitch, and then reconstruct it, tell my story on top of that story. When I was about 15 years old, I started to collect things that somehow touched me. So from photographs of people that I didn't know, but I liked the photo, or things that I found in markets. I started going to markets when I was about 18 years old and I'm obsessed about markets. It, you have to be able to scan very well because there's a lot of information. Then with the years and with the experience, you start to understand how to very fast scan what's important and what's not important. I wanted to express myself through art and I was creating small scale pieces, doing a few exhibitions and those pieces were all Start, they all started from an object that I had found. Some of them I had found 10 years ago. They were still at my studio, but I decided to celebrate them at the moment when I thought this is it. For example, one of the exhibitions was Small Things to Collect was the name of the exhibition. And it was a collective exhibition. And I had to come in with a piece. And I had a little Mona Lisa painting that I had had for years in my bathroom. And it was, you know, just there on a corner somewhere in a flea market, I got it. And I, and I had it there and I thought, okay, small things to collect. So the format was perfect. And what is it about Mona Lisa that I think is extraordinary? And I think it's her smile. And what is it about her smile? It's sweet, it's very dolce. It's, what did I do? I asked my miniature artist that I work with for many years to, to make uh, 50 bees for me, little very small bees. And I applied all the bees around her mouth, around her, her smile, and then at the bottom of the painting, it was inside a drawer, inside a little box with a drawer underneath. There were little bottles, little glass flasks with the honey. So it was a whole, and it was called The Sweet Smile of Mona Lisa. So just for you to see how that piece 10 years later came to life. Anyway, yeah, I don't like the word garbage. I don't like the word lishu. I, I don't, the, the, everybody said to me at that time, shit, you, you only collect shit. I mean, this is all shit. And, uh, and I thought, okay, you call it shit, okay. But I had no problems with that. For me, I knew that every piece had density, the ones that I was collecting, and I knew I would celebrate them further ahead. So yes, I did get a lot of stuff that I found or that I, or that I bought in second hand, or sometimes I even stole, you know? I love stealing little things. Little things, never from people's houses, always from public spaces. Like streets, blah, blah. I'm not gonna get into details, I can't. <laughs> but I have, I have a line, I'm gonna tell you that. I have a... <laughs> a sequence, a Stolfi sequence called Objet Robé. Okay, and it's numbered. And every object has a number, zero, 01. I'm already in 058. And I, I usually offer it to someone. It's Objet Robé by Ashtolfi. And there's a line, there's always a dedication and a date. So Objet Robé by Ashtolfi. The international school was fundamental for me, was fundamental. I had a very close contact with my teachers, very close. It was a one-to-one -one relationship. Everybody knew who Joanna was uh, in, as a person, as a human being. They knew what I loved, they knew what, what I didn't like so much, they knew what, where I could excel, what were my virtues and what were my weaknesses. They accompanied me very, very closely. That I remember very well. They pushed me where they had to push me. They, 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 they fine-tuned me in, in a lot of ways. They taught me how to research very deeply, okay? I did a lot of, they taught us how to be more curious if you're not, I was already quite curious, but they taught me how to, okay, you're interested in this, you wanna do a project based on this, okay, go deeper, go look at all sources. So the research side, I still use it very much today. The research and the registering of things so I have thousands of sketchbooks that I sometimes go back to, to remind myself what I saw in that trip that I made to that place, because now it could be interesting, interesting for a project that I'm going to start a hotel in Lisbon, that I'm going to use that reference. So I always register everything. I research a lot. I have to say, I'm never bored. I mean, there's not one moment. I would love to be a little bit bored. You know, I, I'm buying boredom. It's, 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 it's funny how people sometimes say I'm bored and I say, shit, man. I would love to be bored. But anyway, the research side, the closeness to the teachers, my friends were from all around the world. 
so we exchanged stories from our from our cultures, from our lives. That was all very positive in my in my upbringing. All of that, yeah. And I still, I still am in contact with two or three of those teachers. You know, teachers have a lot of can have a lot of impact in your life. Uh, always in in twenty, there'll be one maybe. But I, I still have that contact. It's really special. Yeah. I was very inclined to be an, to being an artist because that's what I loved doing. I was always in the arts department in St. Julian's, painting all day. That's where I lived. It was my life. I breathed arts. I mean, it was my salvation. It was everything for me. But I also loved being at my father's studio, making models with him, watching the projects grow, going with him on site, seeing things growing. You know, from I. I remembered his drawings and he would explain to me, okay, I'm drawing now a hotel, for example. This is how the bedrooms are gonna be. This is the, the foyer, this is the restaurant. And then he would say, come with me, come on site. Let's see how, I remember he would put the helmet on me and we'd go together. And he would explain to me how things were done, the pillars, the structure, the, and I would see it growing. One day we had a conversation. So when I was about 15, I had to choose, okay, what's the direction now? And we, and we had a, a really special conversation, me and my father. And he said to me, I said, Dad, I'm going to have to now, you know, choose a direction because I have to apply for the, for the, for the IB. I have to choose the, 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 the subjects that I want to study and then I have to, that has to be already related to what I'm going to go do in university. And I'm super divided. I mean, I, I love the story, the, the whole thing that I see happening in your life, but I'm, you know, art is my life. And so he said, Joanna, I'm not going to say to you what you should do, but this is my, this is my um, suggestion. Art, you will always do all your whole life. You can always go back, come back uh, to art. You can always paint for the rest of your life. It's in you. But architecture, if you study architecture, one, it's going to open up a lot of doors in your head. It's a very beautiful degree to study because it touches on a lot of things. And you will guarantee yourself a profession. It's also a vocation. And if you also, and I know you enjoy it, if you have this interest in architecture, I would say to you, study architecture, guarantee that as your profession, and then do whatever you want to do after that. And I said, makes sense. So, so that's it. So then we went together, we traveled, we went to see a lot of universities together in the UK. That's where I wanted to study. He, we decided that I wouldn't go directly to London because too much information for an 18 year old girl. And so we went to, uh, we, we, we saw lots of, and then we decided on which ones and, and it totally made sense. That's when I started thinking in three dimensions. During my degree, every year that passed, I understood, and this is something that you just feel inside you and it's a calling, no? it's an umbilical. I started to understand that what I really enjoyed was working from inside out. So I, I, I really enjoyed the scale of the interiors. I really enjoyed uh, designing up to the doorknob to how, you know, the wood, what's the pattern of the wood paneling? You know, I like to draw things to the detail. And uh, so it's a question of scale and it's a question of detail also. My father was the opposite. I understood that my direction was completely different from his, that if I one day I would go ahead and be an architect and have a studio, whatever, it would be in this kind of more inside, the interior side of architecture. So it was, and also the rehabilitation of spaces, which, which interests me a lot. I prefer to give a second life to a space, to resuscitate a space, than to start from a white page, from blank page, much more. And most of my projects are rehabilitation. Every week I go to see a space, or more than one, that, had, that is, is complete as a whole. You know, it's totally destroyed, or it has been something, and now it's totally decharacterized. And the idea is to give it a second life. So what really moves me is to give a second chance, a second life to a space or to an object. He only had a few months left to live if he didn't have the liver transplant. So it was a huge battle and a very big fight that my mother, who's a big, big lioness also, she had to do this fight with me, but I was young, I was 20, I didn't know exactly how to, how I only was there to also to support her, 
But she managed to put my father on the list, on the transplant list. They did not want to operate my father. They said he will not survive. He's very, very um, weak, very, very weak. And he was. He was at the hospital being balanced because the, the liver no longer filtered anything. And there were days where he didn't recognize me because the toxins were in his head. So he was not. But I always took, and I still have in my memory vitrine at home, which was the... Um, this really makes me a bit emotional. It was, was the the cassette that I took of Maria Petania for him to listen to. I was always pushing him, you know, always giving him something to stimulate his head and his memory and everything. And so I, I think that I also had a big, a big role in keeping him alive. And then we finally got the, the, the feedback that he was on the list. There he went, we all went together and they prepared him and he was very relaxed and he said, let's do this, you know, let's do this. I gave him a kiss. I said, so I'll see you in a while. Huh? I'm, wait I'm waiting for you right here. And so then that's it. And it was interesting because he went into the operation. We had to go home. It was a long thing. And during the night, I was with my mother in the living room. We slept together in the living room. We, were, we couldn't even go to the bedroom. And, and I felt a lot of peace. I remember feeling very peaceful. And then the next morning we, we called and they said the operation had gone well. And that's it. And then, I, and then you know, day by day, I would go there to see my father for a whole year, every day with him. Once again, Maria Petania, capitals, books, drawings, teaching him how to sign his name, how to walk again, how to talk again, everything from scratch. When I arrived, I took my portfolio. I, I knew which, which studios I wanted to go and, and, and show my portfolio to, but I didn't even have the chance to do any of that because when I arrived, I stayed at a friend's house first and then I was looking for, I went to a play, uh, an office, a, play, a real estate agency to look for a place to live. And um, Nicholas was the guy who was there and he said to me, ah, we were looking for a house for me. So he said, oh, you're an architect, right? Because he, he, saw, he, he saw something that, um, I said, yes, I am. He said, you know, I have a lot of uh, cafes and houses and I'm constantly buying places. I have a real estate agency, not just to help people find a place to live, but to develop. And you know, I'm looking for a young architect. Who knows, we could do something together. Come tomorrow for breakfast with me, show me your work. Show, I know you're still young, but show me what kind of things you like to do. Right? So I went and he completely bet all his chips on me. And he said, okay, Joana, the first challenge for you is the house in Puerto Velo. Okay, we have to redo this whole house. It's totally destroyed inside and uh, it's yours. So you just tell me what you need. You do the project. I'll get the constructors and you organize the whole thing. You get, if you need someone else to work with you, we can also find someone else. My God. And I cried so much in the bathroom those, the, oh, during that so six months because the problem was not drawing. The problem was not creating because there was also not a huge budget. It was a, a, almost like a plastic surgery to the house, that, taking away what was not well and and working on a very light way what was needed. That was okay, designed some furniture, designed the finishes, okay, choose the materials, okay. The problem is the construction. Being on site is a very immersive and you need, and it's only after 30 years of experience that you feel comfortable on site when you can say, okay, that junction is not right, you have to put that pillar down. It's something that you, you need to go and go and go and make mistakes and make mistake and make another mistake and then you've got it. And I had not made yet any mistakes because it was my first time. So these, uh, I remember there was a group of Ukrainians and we hardly could communicate in the same language. And so we had to do the floor three times, the flooring, we had to, they had to repaint four times. They had, everything came out wrong the first time and the second time. And there was me and I was saying, Nicholas, I'm going through such a complicated time. And he just said to me, Joana, you just do what you have to do. Money is not a problem. You just do what you have to do. If you don't get it right the first time, if you don't feel the, 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 the team is good, we'll call another team of constructors. You just tell me what you need. But this is your challenge, and I want you to finish this. But it was almost like he said, I'm gonna, I see this girl has talent, and I'm going to help her to grow. You know. But it was very overwhelming for me. And then the second thing that we did together went better. I stayed two years working with him and it, things were rolling a bit more smoothly towards the end, but it was, my God, it was a big challenge. It's like a bunker, all in concrete, designed by Tadao Andu, 
one of the world's biggest archi Japanese architects, in the middle of nowhere. So there's Venice, there's Treviso, which is like Cascais and Lisbon, okay? And outside of Treviso, 20 minutes out by bus, there is this most famous think tank, creative think tank in the world called Fabrica. We work inside this concrete building and it has this big circumference with, uh, with glass and we're down there so the light comes in but we're inside almost like a cave. 300 portfolios arrive per day at Fabrica. Very few get the chance to, to, they're picked by finger from all over the world so there was every nationality you can imagine, all the creative arts. We leave Fabrica and we're still together because we go and have a drink together at the local Bottegon, you know. The, and then we leave there and we all live together, and not in groups. So it's always, we're always brewing together, you know, we're always creating together. And it, for me, it was it, fundamental to express, to push myself further, to, to see until where I could go, you know, with a 12 hour day, full on with huge brainstorm sessions with geniuses. Everybody in Fabrica is a little genius. They're all very young. I lost my boyfriend there because I couldn't, I couldn't hold everything together. It was, I forgot I had a boyfriend practically and I had been with him for two years. He came with me from Portugal even. He left his job here and we, came, we went together and he went to work at the Colors magazine, which is also part of Fabrica. And I was completely um, obsessed. This one was definitely marked me for life and I met people uh, there uh, that I still am very close to today. I rented a little flat, but I was in love was with a little space on the corner of the opposite street. It was like beautiful. The wood, the ceiling was like this, but it was only 20 square meters. The ceiling was all in wood. The floor was in tiles. The walls were in stone, it was beautiful. The materials were beautiful. The truth of the space, it was in truthful, you know, in terms of materials, very authentic. And I said, ah, this could be the space where I could work. So I was there, enamorada by the space, and I felt, ah, oh, this is it. I went to speak to the owner, he said, mm, you know, this is gonna be a wine bar, you know, this is a wine bar, we're, we're working for a wine bar. And I said, ah, oh, but you know, I, I've been away for so long and I live right here now and I, I wanna start my little, studio, whatever this is going to be, but this is it, this inspires me. I can see myself sitting here with two windows leading to the street with the Maria Cachucha bar on the other side of the street. So I thought, shit, this is great. I'm going to take my beer, bring it here at night. I'm going to bring my friends in here. We're all going to brainstorm together. This is going to be fantastic, you know, biggest projects are going really to come out of here. So I convinced the guy, probably because he saw this, <laughs> she's never going to leave me alone. So I was persistent, like I still am today, when I really want something. The studio was much more expensive than my house, which is funny, but, but it worked. So I had a bit of both worlds, architecture and art. We have a studio, the clean space, where we receive our clients, where we, where we have lunch, where the architects work mostly. And we have the artists in the workshop, and that's the, the dirty area, you know, where the mess happens, where the noise happens, where everything, you know, where all the, psh, everything explodes. I started uh, making one project, two projects, then someone saw that project, called us for another project, then we made another one. And the level was there, I, I hope, I think, the level was always there. And we were always trying, I tried to surpass it and to surpass it and to surpass it. And what happened? The studio got more and more work. We had to move to bigger spaces. I started to understand I had to create two departments. So one for architecture and interiors and one for the arts. And the architecture projects were going ahead with the restaurants of Zé, of the village that we also started doing, with, the, with some shops for Manzara, for Andrea Ótica. We did Park Bar at the top of the, in the Calçado do Combro. You know, a lot of, we were doing, but the art spoke louder. They were our passport. It was where, you know, it was my salvation also, it was where I could dream so high, you know. Lisbon, started getting invaded, in a good way, in my opinion, by the world, you know, by all kinds of uh, foreigners and coming, living, wanting to set up businesses, hotels, shops, restaurants. And so we already had a portfolio and we started being called more and more for architecture. So today, in the last three years, this has gone round in the sense that architecture is maybe 60%, 65% of our work is the architecture today. People are investing much more in spaces than in art. So we have to, you know, we have to accompany the stream. So Yastofi is a, is a big family. We all get along very well. There's a lot of respect. There's a lot of friendship. 
We help each other a lot. Sometimes the architects go to the arts workshop and they help out if we're in finishing a project because we always have very, we always work with deadlines. No ambition of being a, you know, a famous artist or of having a huge studio or of dominating, nothing like that. I always thought I was going to be a complete, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> I knew I had an artist way of being. I still have it today. I was not a business oriented person. I was an artist at essence. So I was and I am. And, and, and so I thought, you know, it's not easy to live as an artist. You know, you have to, something has to work. Something has to trigger. Something has to go well. That fusion was really the secret was what happened, was this fusion and the creation of a language that today is Astolfi, and I don't even have to appear because it's everywhere now. I mean, we've done a lot of, we've done more than 100 projects in 15 years. It's about taking risks. It's about coherency. It's about consistency. It's about being rigorous always. It's about taking yourself to the limit of being obsessive but knowing also when it gets too much, because obsession can also be counterproductive. Passion and making mistakes and ma letting mistakes happen and learning from those mistakes, because I made many, 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 many. And during the creative process, I always welcome these mistakes. They turn the results around many times.